Mark, what do you think is the biggest advantage of Greek wine and compared to other countries like or other regions like um, uh, Etna or uh, the new wave wines of uh, Spain, for example? Well, it, I think there, there's, all, there's two questions there, if you yeah. forgive me. Yeah. The first so, one is, is maybe what's more. the... Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The first one is, is, like, is what is the biggest advantage that Greek, yeah. Greek wine sort of has yeah. in its locker? And the second one is then, in relative terms, how does that uh, play off or compare to, to what other people Correct. are doing? Um, and to, you know, the, I think the first, the first part of it is, is kind of what we've been talking about, is that you know, Greece is a relatively small winemaking country, you know, 60-odd thousand hectares, which is, you know, for context, is half the size of Bordeaux, you yep. know. Um, it's about the same size as Rioja. You know, that's the entire Greek vineyard is about the same size as the region of Rioja. So we're not talking about an enormous um, potential sort of bulk wine competitor here. We're talking about a place which is far more diverse geographically uh, than people who are not Greek would uh, and who don't visit regularly would have any idea. You know, the mountains and the, you know, the, the, the snow capped peaks of, of the north and central Greece, you know, are a very different place to the, the Greek islands and the incredible, you know, beaches. And, and even in the even in a place like the Peloponnese, you can go from from mountains to the beach in, you know, in no time at all. So yep. it's an incredibly sure. diverse geography um, and it's an incredibly diverse palette of indigenous varieties. I think I'm right in saying that after Italy, it has the most uh, indigenous varieties of any country. Uh, maybe France sneaks in between. I'm not sure. But certainly it's, it's in the top three. You know, and let's be honest, these indigenous varieties, most wine fans could probably name three or four at most um, before they would, you know, they would start to run into trouble. And and that, again, is a massive advantage for Greece, not necessarily today, but tomorrow. You know, it, it's this incredible palette of indigenous varieties, many of which are undiscovered gems. They've They've got so much potential and and uh, and so much character and uniqueness about them and so i would say that the the diversity of towers the diversity of um of varieties and and then the fact that we are still very much at the early part of the modern greek wine story mm -hmm. i think those combine to make greece uh, for me the most exciting wine country in the world you know in terms in terms of of looking forward you know, how it can how it can develop and how it can change. Looking into the future. And Mark, where have you found distinctiveness? Um, varieties, terroirs, even wines. We're free to discuss. We're not politicians. We can we can discuss freely about I'm definitely not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean it's a great question, Janice. It's this is the kind of this is the kind of question that, you know, we talk about over three or four bottles of wine you know over a long a long dinner um it's i think for those of us that are really interested in greek wine and, and sort of you know plugged into it and visit the vineyards and visit the regions and you know and, and meet the producers and so on you know i think the there are so many examples but obviously let's try and trim it down to a few one i tell you one that i can't stop thinking about at the moment um yep. in terms of white wines is kefalonia and mm -hmm. listen, you've you've written a lot about Catalonia um, and written some. Great I do stuff have on a bullet here. There you. Who, who's it? Who? What producer is it? I can't say. I'm a politician. Oh, can't you say? <laughs> <laughs> but I can say that it comes from high high altitude vineyards, around 800 meters, old vines, limestone soils. <laughs> right. Okay. So it could be basically anybody from Catalonia who's making Rabola on. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm really excited by by Catalonia. I think. Um, you know, it's it's a, a a wonderful island. Anyone who's who's had the opportunity to visit um, or to see Captain Corelli's mandolin, if you can't visit, um, will know that it's a really beautiful place, and it's a place that has um, you know incredible history. You know, stretching all the way back to Greek mythology, um, as most of Greece is, of course. But uh, but in terms of its wines as well, you know, incredible history. But I think you know, looking now at the, at the soils, at the altitude, at the fact that Rabola is a really, really interesting grape variety, which 
one of the things that I've really enjoyed, and I'm not a politician, so I am going to mention a name here, but one of the things which has been really interesting tasting uh, recently with with Kiki and Nikos from Petrocopolis Wines is is that as they've moved towards this model of uh, single vineyard wines and looking to to sort of to demonstrate the the you know the differences from terroir to terroir, you you know it's only now with that context that you can start to see that Rebola really does have the potential to be. Uh, to, to demonstrate the authenticity of, of different mm -hmm. terroirs within within a specific place, you know, and we've seen that in Santorini with the Certico. Even though single vineyard wines are still, relatively speaking, a rarity there, the people that have done it, and you know, the Sigalas project of seven villages is a is a fascinating way to to look into that in more detail. And I think that's you know that is something which has happened relatively recently. Recently, and, yes. And you know, Kefalonia is still quite a way behind. Uh, Santorini in terms of, of of where it sits on the curve in terms of the conversation there. You know, there are a small number of wineries on Catalonia. I mean, we can count them on one hand, really, that are, you know, aside from the cooperative, that are, are doing anything. And, you know, thankfully, they're really quite different in terms of what they what they're presenting, you presenting know, Sklavos, people, yeah. is very different to Petrocopolis is very different to yeah. Gentilini is very different to, to Saris and you know the Saris wines have really impressed me as a newcomer maybe to that group of, yep. uh, of, agree. of wineries so I think what I see in in Kefalonia at the moment is really exciting I love the great variety and I'm yeah I'm looking forward to seeing how once the this incredible terroir of Mount Enos is sort of broken down a little bit more into into its distinct parts, getting into that and having a look at how that can be interpreted via Rebola will be really exciting. May I add, uh, Mark, here about yeah, Catalonia, yeah. that all these producers offer distinctive proposals. So every style is different. Yeah. Sclavos has its own style, Petracopoulos its own, uh, Marca Donatos, uh, Gentilini, a different style. There is a pro And even the cooperative. Even the co-ops, well, yes. you know, yes. as, as co-ops go, Ivos, think, yeah, Saris, yeah, different, different um, expressions of Robola and of Kefalonia. And you know, and to, to tie back, Yanis, into what you were asking about authenticity, and you, yep. you mentioned the word originality, which is, uh, I, I agree with. As I, I think it's almost distinct from the authenticity in the sense that you you can still be original while mm -hmm. being authentic, but they are sort of almost two disparate concepts that can kind of the the most exciting wines are on the intersection of originality and authenticity which is okay. might sound like a contradiction in terms but I, I think that the two can coexist mm -hmm. and i think what you just said there about the wineries and their styles on Catalonia kind of is is further sort of um evidence of that you know the, the yeah. you've got these different people who are making authentic wines but they're doing it through a slightly different interpretation different way, of the yeah. land of the grape and mm -hmm. of, of how they, they present it. Um, you know, you're not going to confuse Sclavos's wines with Gentilini's wines, no. but there is an audience for, for both of them. For both, yes. Um, and, you know, and I think that the fact that Rebola and Kefalonia have the ability, even now, when we're at this very young juncture in its development, the fact that it, it shows the scope for the, for the difference in, in styles, I think is super exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that, that was one. That was just oh, right. that was Catalonia. Um, Can I have think, one more? Maybe yeah, one more? I'll give you a red. I'll give you a, a red uh, PDO, which I personally think is maybe the most exciting undiscovered. I mean, it's not completely undiscovered, but relatively undiscovered uh, place in in Europe, which is Rapsani. I, you know, I, I just I am completely in love with Rapsani. Um, yeah. I think it's a magical place. I think the terroir in the it, it, it's quite. It changes uh, from, you know, as you move up the Mount, Mount Olympus, but uh, some of the great vineyards of Rapsani that I've been able to visit with Stanos Dugos, with Apostolos Stimiopoulos, you know, the terroir in these, in these vineyards is exceptional. This, this incredible schist and uh, it's just beautiful. And then you've got these old, often own rooted vineyards, you know, blended not just with Xena Mavro, which is a, we, anyone who knows Greek wine will know how wonderful that variety is and, and what potential it has to create amazing wines. Um, Stavroto, maybe less so. I know that some of the guys who make wine in, in Rapsani are not always too impressed with it. But certainly Crosato, which kind of sits in the middle there, is, you know, is, is showing potential of its own, certainly as part of the blend. Um, and, you know, listen, we're at, we're at a really early stage with Rapsani. Um, 
but I think what has been demonstrated already with uh, with the wines that have come out from the last few vintages there, it's mega exciting and it's gorgeous. Love it. And it has also the marketing story of being on the foothills of uh, Mount Olympus. I mean, this is the absolute uh, uh, narrative that we can we can add to the quality of the terroir and the wines. Yeah, I, I think you know there's, story. There's, there's different conversations, isn't there? Like you know, I can yeah. I can sit here today as Mark from Noble Rock talking to uh, wine lovers and people who, you know, who are into the, the stuff that we're into. And I'll talk, I'm talking about Rapsani on that level. But if yeah. we were having a different conversation and I was sat here and this was a, you know, like a, a Zoom meeting with the, yeah. the Growers Association or with, you know, the Wines of Greece or um, generic body or whatever, if it was a different conversation, and we were talking about, okay, we have this in our hands, how do we sell this to the world? Then yeah, you're absolutely right. The, yeah. fact, that it is, um, the fact that it is wine made on Mount Olympus is absolutely, it's, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't make it up. It's gold dust. It's, uh, yeah. there, there is no better marketing story in the world of wine. But marketing, you know, as a word, to me, it kind of implies that you have to create something out of nothing. I know that's not necessarily the case, but the reason why I say that is because with Rapsani, you don't, that story is true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it is the reality. A hundred percent. That these wines yeah. are grown yeah. on the slopes of Mount Olympus, yeah. one of the most just beautiful added. ancient um, winemaking spaces on planet Earth. Um, and not just that, but it is an exceptional place to grow grapes and to make wine from as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just that it, it has this, you know, the, this Dionysian backstory. You know, it, it is also an incredible spot to grow grapes and to make wines. So. Unfortunately, uh, there are not a lot of producers, but hopefully uh, we will see more stuff in the near future. I'm, I'm very excited as well about Rapsani. Well, maybe, the, uh, maybe this will segue into another conversation. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you're, you're yeah. the host, not me. But um, <laughs> what I think is, is really, to. really interesting, I'll, and I'll come back to that, that point that you made there in just, uh, just one second. Yes. I remember uh, long ago <laughs> when I was first getting involved in the wine industry sort of 15 or so years ago um france was like was my everything really and burgundy was the reason i got into wine and you know and i was really into the Rhone and, and so on but i've always loved having my sort of classic places where i really you know i, I go there all the time i've got detailed sort of relationships and knowledge and uh you know and and that's kind of my professional life revolves to some extent around champagne burgundy rhone Bordeaux because that's you know that's where the the highest concentration of the best wines in the world are to be found um and but I always love to have something different as well on the go I love to have mm -hmm. an, a you know an area or a region which is maybe a bit more undiscovered and which I can really get my teeth into sort of going through the back streets and and finding out you know what it is that other people maybe haven't discovered yet you know I'm sure there are many many people watching who feel exactly the same and I uh I used to love the, the Languedoc when I first got in, interested in wine. And I'd been holidaying in the Languedoc and I, you know, I thought, okay, well, you know, this is interesting. You know, people aren't talking about Picpoul de Pinay because it was before Picpoul de Pinay took off. Not that that's the most exciting wine region in the world, but you know what I mean. Uh, and the Terras de Larzac was really coming on stream yep. and, you, you know, Grange de Pair and Domas There were some, and, some things, yeah. yeah. It was cool. It was, a, it was an interesting place. I, I think it really missed the boat. Uh, it kind of, just as it was getting interested, everybody's focus not everybody but a lot of people's focus mm. turned towards scores turned towards extraction yeah. and you know and oak okay and, you know like i say this is i'm talking quite a while ago here. yeah okay so i've always i've always kind of liked to have that you know on a, a, an extra like separate region and so greece kind of offers you know a million things that are like that but the the connection that i'm drawing there is in the longer dock the, it was the land of cooperatives and it was going through this period where the co-ops had kind of broken down and there was all of these young growers that were sort of coming along and reclaiming their fruit back from the co-op and saying right well my dad used to sell to the co-op but now I'm going to make my own wine and so on and so forth so it was like a completely new era that the longer dot moved into and I feel like Greece in a few places is at exactly that point at this sort of it hasn't dropped yet but it has the scope because the fruit is there but if yeah. you look at samos you know samos yeah. is a great example because what the, an am amazing place yeah and that's we can come back to samos but you know the the as the law has changed there um 
Stamos has, has been able to, to now position it to show to show what is in there. And you know, you've got producers like yeah. Nupera who are maybe the first to start to take advantage of that. But you know, they they grow mm. beautiful grapes. They're making really interesting wines, and you know, they're the it's early days for those guys. But you know, it's it's an exciting time. And and Samos, up until this point, has been all cooperative wine. Yes. So now we're finally at the stage where people can start to pull their wines, their grapes out of the cooperative and young growers can start to think about becoming young vignerons, you know, doing the whole thing like they yeah. did in the, in, in the longer dock, as, as I was discovering there. And yeah. to bring it back to Rapsani, you know, the Santali who, you know, let's, let's be fair. They, they kind of saved the, the PDO or the appellation, whatever you want to call Absolute. it. In Absolutely. You know, those guys, those guys did a great job of, of keeping Rapsani alive as a wine. In the map. As in a wine the map. Yeah. yeah. And they gave, they gave the growers um, an opportunity to, to grow and sell their grapes and to stay alive, mm -hmm. you know, yep. uh, to, to, keep, to keep going. Now, what we have at the moment is a situation where, like you said, there are very few growers there. We've got Thanos, we've got... Um, uh, Thanos Dugos. We've got uh, Apostolus' project. We've got Chrisa, who I think make uh, some wine there. And we've got yep. a couple of other small scale things, you know, that that are not necessarily inside the PDO of Rapsani, but, you know, that they're, they're growing grapes there. Yeah. But Santali, which effectively kind of took the place of the cooperative, you know, they, they, they buy a lot of fruit from a lot of growers there. It's all yeah. relative, you know, I'm not talking about it on longer dock scale, but, you know, it's all, there's, there's plenty of fruit there. And the question that I have is now whether in places like Samos, Rapsani, Kefalonia, mm -hmm. you know, Kefalonia's cooperative is, is a really powerful cooperative as well. Are we, are we about to see a whole new generation of growers oh. and vignerons that can yeah. come out of, out of that cooperative dominated era? Yeah. What do you, what do good, you think? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think in a, in a small scale, we can see more efforts in the next two or three years. I'm expecting some stuff, but not in a big scale at this point. Maybe after two or three years, we will see more. But it would be interesting to see uh, on the context of Rapsani, 100% Crasato, 100% Stavroton, yeah. other varieties that uh, you know, people didn't talk about. They, they used to have a blending uh, uh, role to be expressed by 100% uh, wines. I think yeah. we're going to see fantastic, fantastic new efforts in the next three to five years. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I think, you know, I think we also have to be, you'll be, you, you know this better than I do, but, you know, there is, the, the economic crisis was not great for Greece by any stretch of the imagination. And Absolutely. as a result, you know, we're, we're at the, we're at a point now where people might say, well, you know, and Crete is another example where the cooperatives are still quite dominant in places like Pesa and, and so on. And, you know, what do you do? Do you say, well, you know, times are tough, but I'm going to take the risk of getting a bank loan to buy some tanks, to buy some barrels, to get some space to make some wine, or, you know, or do I continue doing what I'm doing, which is keeping me alive, which is selling my grapes to the cooperative every, every harvest. And, you know, so there has to be a bit of a, a cultural break there or an economic break, which will shift gear from one set of circumstances to another. Okay. And uh, just to, to, to wrap up this uh, question, uh, all these PDOs have limited vineyards. 100 hectares, so they will need new plantations, which is tricky. Mm. And a lot of them are field blends, so you, you can see the implications when you want to make a 100% varietal wine or make another um, uh, expression of, of the area of the terrain. Yeah, I mean, that will be very difficult, particularly in Rapsani, because a lot of the vineyards are quite old and they're kind of, yeah. they're planted a third, a third, a third between the yeah. three grape Field blends. Blend, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's so it's tricky. But yeah, I, I think the big thing is you're right about new plantations. But I think the first phase that I'm really excited to see whether or not we do see this over the, the next five, ten the years. The vignerons, the vignerons, yeah, the, is the emergence yeah. of families saying, yeah. "Well, I've got space to make wine, and yeah. you know, I've got the grapes. So now I need to get off that sort of uh, that merry-go-round, which is the cooperative uh, economy. Yeah. And if I can jump off that, then I can I can start to do my to, to have my own voice in this conversation about Samos, Rapsani, Kefalonia, whatever else it might be.
you are giving a lot of ideas to vignerons. <laughs> anyway, uh, listen. The, if you're if you're a young if you're a, yeah. if you're a young uh, girl or a young guy growing up in a family that owned vines, you know, many of them might go off to to Bone or Dijon or to Bordeaux or to Davis or to Adelaide mm -hmm. or whatever. Or let's not forget the two brilliant uh, schools in Greece, in Thessaloniki and in Athens, to you know to learn how to be vignerons, to learn how to be uh, to not just um, in yes. cultural terms, but enologists. And then, yes. you know. This is absolutely key. Education at the top level, educating people and, you know, getting the best uh, out of our involve involvement in the vineyard. <laughs>